view to the admitting now, and then I will um, yeah. uh, introduce all of you out there. <laughs> so Graham is, is uh, very popular. We have 772 signed up. No, not all will be live, but um, as you all know, the YouTube channel Nordic Laboratories and DNA Live, where we will send you links uh, to the recording. But those of you who sometimes miss out uh, a, a webinar, you can always uh, follow the Nordic Laboratories end with this end sign on YouTube. And if some of you have not found your way to the Facebook group that is called Nordic Laboratories uh, Practitioner Support, then please do that. Um, it's, it's, it's really getting more and more exciting uh, being in there. And there's a lot of practitioners who helps each other. So you're not, it's just not waiting for the practitioners at Nordic who can or, uh, answer your questions, but there's a nice discussion going through uh, between different practitioners. So that's really nice. So please find uh, the group, answer the questions and uh, we will allow you in as soon as uh, possible. So anyway, I'm Anne Catherine, co-founder of Nordic Laboratories and DNA Life. We focus on healthcare, healthcare for the future in regards to functional medicine, personalized medicine. All lab tests that Graham is talking about today and all the lab tests that we in general uh, talk about, you can find on your practitioner profile on uh, Nordic VMS or DNA Life VMS, depending on which platform you have been, has been assigned to. That depends on where you live in the world. So um, I have been quite busy uh, the last um, few weeks because we are working on a new platform for VMS. So we have the front end designer, Pablo, he's from Argentina, and we have Danish, our back end programmer from Pakistan. They're both in Denmark. Well, Danish lives in Denmark, and Pablo is up visiting us from Spain. Um, and uh, I had hoped to launch now, but um, yeah, it takes time um, being creative and wanting to offer you uh, the best tool. So um, we will do some more in-house testing before we uh, launch. I had hoped May month, but it probably will be June. So uh, there's some new features in the new VMS. Some of these webinars will be integrated in the VMS and also uh, some of the educations that you have purchased will be integrated there. Um, I'm sitting with Shania and Graham actually also today uh, doing uh, Nordic prescriptions for your inspiration so that if you are sitting with a test result and you just want some inspiration for some form of pattern or something, we're trying to create some, um, some prescriptions so that if it's like a cybomethane protocol or hydrogen protocol or a low um, beneficial flora protocol we've made, we've made a um, menopause program made it today and so on. So we're just continuing making these and we will keep adding them. Uh, and of course, there will be also different ordering features. Um, and there will be for you so that you can write in journal notes in the best GDPR style. So uh, all sorts of exciting things. And we have an even longer wish list as well, just so that we can continue improving. So um, I think that's kind of the news that I just want to tell you about. Um, so then our next webinar, we have sent out the invites is on the 3rd of June. It's not with Graham, it's with Dr. Tom Bain. Uh, and the title is Paradigm Shift in Probiotics. Uh, so he's going to present uh, all sorts of information and clinical pearls in regards to probiotics. Um, and then we have Graham again on the 17th of June in regards to thyroid testing. I'm looking forward to that. And today, it's about GI 360 and GI fix in one go. Graham, have you? Uh... Yeah, that was silly as we talked about last time. I don't know what it was. Must have been a late night decision to uh, to decide to try and do both of these in in one quick seminar. So uh, yeah, it's going to be it's difficult to, to cover all aspects. So it's uh, as usual. It's going to be a bit of a, a whirlwind. Good. But anyway, I will hide myself here and then I will pass on the stage to you. 
Remember, we are recording. We will share the recording. Uh, we will share the slides. We will share um, also links to uh, the test so that you can see test results and so on. So anyway, I'll mute myself now. Okay, great. So let me just share my, my screen here. Okay, can you just nod if you can see this okay, Anne Catherine? Yeah, great. All right, so GI360 and GIFX, two very common stool analysis tests uh, that we, we use regularly um, here at Nordic Clinic in, in Stockholm. Um, certainly, personally, I have more experience with the GI360, I would say, than the, the GIFX. But of course, today I'm going to talk about some of the different differences here. So the, um, the goal of the session today is just identify where GI360 and um, GIFX testing can be helpful under what circumstances, some result interpretation, treatment strategy, and just going to go through two, two case or two examples of, of a report. So as I've talked about in previous uh, stool testing sessions, the one on GI map, I mean, we've got a number of different clinical reasons why we might want to um, want to run the, uh, the, the some kind of stool analysis on the left hand side here. Uh, so from everything from gas bloating, constipation, etc. here going down, but the, the list is is quite endless really because the microbiome is linked with most chronic conditions, syndromes, etc. Now, if, um, you know, if you're working with a client or patient and they have any of these more, what we call more, more serious red flag symptoms, always good if you're not a doctor or you're not working with a doctor in any way to refer them back um, to their to their doctor for, for further analysis. So I always note if I if I'm working alone, so I'm not sharing a case with the with one of the doctors here. Uh, I'm going to do things like writing writing my clinical notes if they've not had a colonoscopy, endoscopy, etc. And usually suggest that um, if they're not working with one of our private doctors, that they see their or ask their GP if that's required. And that just, of course, helps, you know, it's good due diligence if you're, if you're not a medical practitioner. So lots of different reasons why we might want to run one of these tests. Here are the, like I say, main conditions down the, down the left-hand side that clinically would be um, an indication to run uh, a stool analysis. Of course, we can get symptoms over a slow course, if you like, um, from sedentary lifestyle to Western diet, proton pump inhibitors, et cetera here. Of course, there could be a rapid course to, to GI dysfunction or issues um, from nerve damage, food poisoning, antibiotics, et cetera here as well. So we see a lot of different reasons as to why GI symptoms can develop. Now you have to think big, of course, because the GI tract is, is made up of, of different sections. Um, and of course, it also has other organs that are connected. So we might have to think about some simple things like stimulating the cephalic response and chewing the food properly, all the way down to the more complex issues and pathology where you may be working with a gastroenterologist. For, for example. Um, so you, you're gonna have to think if you want to resolve GI symptoms, you're gonna have to think big, you're gonna have to look at all lifestyle environmental factors, as well as potentially pathology, as well as uh, of course, lifestyle and nutrition in detail. So don't expect to find the root cause all the time and say it, it's more rare these days where we, we just find one thing that is contributing to all symptoms. Of course, one of the most obvious things being you know, bloating and gas, running a cyber test, getting a positive result and then treating that, uh, you know, that that's certainly always a nice response, but in most cases, there's, there's often you know, multiple contributing factors. So make sure to do your detective work and consider 
all options or all contributors. In regards to you know, what do I advise, if you're new to GI testing, then usually I would suggest to, to start with what's called the, the CSAP test times two or times three, um, because it, there's a lot of good commentary with that report. It, you, you don't have the added complexity of the GI360, the GIFX kind of whole microbiome balance or analysis. So it's a little bit easier to work with in, in that regard and interpret if you're new and, and, and starting out. It's a, a really nice entry test. It's been around for many years. I mean, I know Anne Catherine and I have, have used it for a long, long time. I mean, we still use the, the CSAP uh, occasionally at the clinic here in Stockholm. So it's a fantastic test. If you're brand new to, to kind of you know, functional medicine analysis of the, the GI tract, I mean, ideally, of course, what you want to do is discuss the patient's symptoms and start to advise and recognize where the different tests are most beneficial because each test is slightly unique and is going to have pros and cons. So ultimately, really, the, the, you know, the best way of clinically practicing is to choose the best test in accordance with the patient. Uh, symptoms, your suspicions and their, their history. But of course, there's scientific value in running the same test all the time, because then of course you get much more experience with one test. You're using the same technology, the same process. So it can be better for scientific rigor, so to speak, because then you're, you're capturing the same data over and over again. So um, it's not necessarily a total bad thing to run the same test all the time, but of course, if you're looking for Helicobacter pylori, for example, you're gonna get that as standard on a, a GI map compared to where these other tests like um, GIFX or GI360, you're gonna to have to buy the, or the patient's gonna to have to buy the add-on. So you need to be aware what these test measures and what, of course, you wanna look for, because the worst case would be you, you pick a test and it's not actually measuring what you want it to. Um, so, of course, all the time we get, get consistently asked, well, what tests do, do you run? Um, I mean, by, by far, my, my most used test is the GI map test. A um, few reasons why. It's only a one-day collection, and um, that's easier for a lot of people because it's not really enjoyable to scoop your own crap um, you know, two or three times, necessarily. Uh, it has Helicobacter pylori, the standard. Um, and we do find quite a lot, uh, I would say it, it's much more before yeah, I started using the GI map, but Helicobacter was, was not so common. But as we've been screening for it more and more, um, we, we found it more, more regularly. So I really like that it's Helicobacter pylori is standard. It's quite competitive on, on price. Um, and I mean, ultimately, a lot of my patients, because I'm involved in clinical research with IBS and a functional medicine model. I mean, a lot of my, my patients are like chronic SIBO, IBS cases. Uh, and I like that it uses this quantitative PCR technology that can even at extremely low levels pick up um, pathogens, which can, can cause an immune reaction, which damages the, um, the migrating motor complex. But also you have to remember that mo all of my patients have, have been through an extensive process usually with their general practitioners, potentially even with the doctors at the clinic here where red flags have been ruled out. So it's, it's easier for me to go into that process. But of course, the GI map, it, it still misses many factors. It, it's not perfect. And of course, no, no test is perfect. They all have their, their pros and cons. So which technology is best? Well, really, it depends what you what you want to know. So PCR, which is um, used in both the GI360 and the GIFX test that we're talking today, that, that's asking the question, is it there? So if you really know what you want to look for, then PCR, if it's available for that, that analyte or that, that microbe, then it's that's certainly probably the best way to find it. But of course, there's only so many number or there's a limited amount of PCR probes. So for example, 
you, you can't find certain bacteria or yeast using PCR. It needs to be done through, uh, through culture. Um, so culture is addressing what is there. And um, that's really a huge benefit with um, both of these tests, although um, the GI360 has a, a higher amount of analytes or microbes that it looks for because it has the, the ability to identify with the, especially with the, the moldy TOF technology used in GI360, you know, well over a, a thousand different yeah, species. So um, what's really nice with GI testing is when it combines the best of technologies and that's what GI360 uh, especially does. GIFX does that as well. And that's more advantageous than GI Math, which only uses one type of technology. So if, um, I mean, if we're looking, if you want to look for most data use, uses multiple technology um, over multiple days, then probably GI360 is your, your best, your, probably your, your most advantageous test because it looks for most pathogens, covers many different microbes, um, but it does get particularly expensive if you're going to include add-ons like Helicobacter pylori, for example. Now, both of these tests, GI, GI360 and GIFX, are around 100 euros more than the GI MAP test. Um, but the GI360 is slightly cheaper than the GIFX, but but not by but not by very much. So, of course always in discussion with the patient or client about the, the costs and the pros and cons, and we, we come to a decision. Um, but overall, as I said, probably GI360, it's when we, when we just look at the amount of things it can identify that's ahead in the field. Now, if you want to measure, um, of course, microbial diversity, along with infection of, of st and stool chemistries, then these two tests we're talking about today, as I said, they're, they're more advantageous than the GI MAP and the CSAP. Just they, they, they look for, for more, for generally more, more markers and they're using different technology. Of course, with microbi um, microbial diversity, the assumption is basically more diverse microbiome, better GI and overall health, but it's gonna complicate the, the report, especially if you're new to GI testing um, because it's, it's pretty difficult to understand what that means. And of course, even in research setting, we're still at roughly at a basic level of, well, more diversity is better. But when we see complex reports, when some are high, some are low, and it's kind of, what does that mean? What's the chicken and what's the egg here? Is the, the microbiome diversity driving the disease or is the disease driving the, the diversity issue in the microbiome? So when you, you know, using these tests, you have to be prepared to not be able to answer all questions and not be able to have necessarily an explanation for everything. Um, so that, that you know, when you do these two, there is a bit of an added layer of complexity. Now, if you only want to measure microbial diversity, there are um, sections of the test you can run and this makes it cheaper for your client. So if you just want to measure that, so you, you don't want parasitology, uh, mycology, stool chemistries, et cetera, then you can run GI360 microbiome or GIFX ecology profile, but the, the cheaper option is the GI360 microbiome. So if you just wanna look at that, these are better than to necessarily, of course, you're, you might be running unnecessary markers that you, you, don't, you don't need. Um, if you want to measure infection, like dysbiosis and diversity, but you don't need the stool chemistries part. So the stool chemistries is the short chain fatty acids, the digestion, absorption, inflammation markers. Then you can do a GI360 essentials, or you can also use the GIFX ecology profile. So normally we'd use this clinically. For example, if I've ran a, a test, first of all, so we've ran the full GI360 yeah, times two, as an example. And um, everything in the stool chemistry section has been absolutely fine. There's been no inflammation, digestion absorption markers were, were great, but maybe there was you know, fungal yeast, parasite, bacterial infection, et cetera. 
and we just want to go back and, and look at those markers, then we, we could choose to do one of this instead of unnecessarily repeat the store chemistries. Now, in regards to IBS, all tests are going to be helpful. So I think you, you can't go too wrong by which one you pick. But the usual situation is GI360 assesses for the most infections, has multiple technologies as part of that process. And I guess in an, an, an ideal setting, I would probably choose to do GI360 with a cyber analysis when analyzing for underlying causes to IBS. You could also do a CSAP and a cyber test. Um, but most commonly, I use a GI map and SIBO combination. If you don't know in the system, we have where you combine tests, actually your, your, your client or patient, they, they save money. So when we run a GI map and SIBO, it's the cheapest combination together. And it's about the same price as running a GI360 GI by itself. Um, so most commonly, that's uh, the one which I, I use most often. But as I said, that's because of the reasons before, like most of my work in IBS is, is around chronic IBS cyber type cases. So that's where I prefer the, the GI map. But of course, it's limited, doesn't have all the expanded yeast and fungal markers. We're only getting the, um, the bacteria which the probes look for. So we're not getting that added situation where we can see some more unique aspects. So if you want to find the unique, unusual infection, if you suspect there's a hard to find parasite, for example, then you're, you're gonna be much better using like the, the GI360 again, because of the, the combination of technology in this moldy tough, um, which is um, a very interesting piece of, of technology that is actually identifying new species of, of yeast, for example. Also in the GI360, you get shock at Leyden crystals, um, which also can be an indication of hidden parasite infection or possibly allergy as well. So that's normally my go-to test if someone has had multiple stool analysis um, and nothing has come back, but there's still ongoing suspicion then that's usually my test of, of choice. Suspected female hormone imbalance related to the GI tract, then GI effects because it has a beta glucuronidase marker, which of course can interfere with glucuronidation. So that would be my preferred test of choice in that regard. If you want to assess for possible like food allergy, then this EPX marker that's included on the GIFX, um, it's the only test with that marker, then um, the, there is also a connection when EPX is raised by itself, it suggests a possible food component to digestive symptoms. So that helps to give you a clue that you might not get from the GI60, for example. Now, I think where the GIFX um, test and Genova are doing a really great job is with the visuals and the report that we're, we're going to go through so that they've really worked on their diagrams and supporting practitioners with interventions as on, on a kind of one page summary so I think that they're really you know or really doing a great job in that aspect that makes it easy to understand that at a glance view as to what you need to what you need to do so it doesn't necessarily mean you will choose, of course, to do um, a GIFX just because of the visual part, but um, it's something to take into consideration. Uh, so I know a lot of practitioners like to use that because of how they present the, the, the information and overall summary. So when we get to the, the GI360, so this is, um, this is, this is what the, 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 the test, oops, sorry, just go back here. Um, just need to move my window around a little. So this is what the, the test looks like, the first two pages here. We have um, you know, a, a diversity summary here. So the, the lower the score, um, then basically 
the, the, the better that is. So a higher score in, indicates greater dysbiosis. So uh, Dr. Stater using this dysbiosis index here, we can see there's a four. And so we know there's some overall dysbiosis going on. Basically this kind of, if you like, um, web chart here, uh, we're, we're looking for the, the, the web to, to follow as close to the middle of the green. So of course, when it's further out, uh, for example, here in the bacterioidetes family, then it's indicating more overgrowth of that family. The closer it is to the middle in the blue area, for example, in the Firmicutes phyla here, then there's you know, again two on the opposite side, too little of that, um, that phyla uh, microbiota in the digestive system. So this is kind of your at a glance, how much is dysbiosis, how much is a dysbiotic situation occurring? And then we have the, the key findings from the report here. So just showing which families were low, which were high, anything else that was found here from the, the stool chemistries or culture, et cetera. So this is kind of your, your at a glance situation. And then as we get into the, um, the, the report here on the right hand side, you can see where the levels of the different families of bacteria are. So, um, so in this case, I mean, just give an example here that we, we've got Clostridia, which is very low. We know Clostridia are important you know, short chain fatty acid producer, particularly butyrate. So in this case, I mean, what I'm gonna do is um, go through the report look at the major phyla, see which are low. And for example, Clostridia here, I could use Jerusalem artichoke, Lactobacillus plantarum, um, or I can calorie restrict the, the client. And those through the research have been shown to actually help to increase Clostridia levels. So then for example, that's gonna be part of my you know, action plan here because again, Clostridia, important family in the Firmicutes, that's where a large part of the, the, the dysbiosis is coming from. So I'm gonna try and increase that, of course, preferably through food-based intervention to, to start with. Um, also iron. So it may be that um, this client is using iron supplementation and that's been shown to actually push down the Clostridia class. So if, they are unnecessarily taking iron, you would be able to hopefully remove that um, and that might help to increase Clostridia. So again, here, I'm looking at the overall picture, seeing where can I make the, the simplest change to actually help to address that, that dysbiosis. This is where we get into the pathogens. So very simple to understand. It would be red and positive if anything is present. So some of this is done through PCR um, and some of this is done through microscopy. So where the parasitologist is looking through the microscope to actually see if there's anything present. Um, here we can see, so no, no parasites, nothing found with, with PCR. Um, nothing or, or microscopy, we're then seeing that yeast is moderate. Um, so we could use, for example, if you're a medical doctor, you could use something like uh, nystatin, for example, or other fungal medication. If you're working more with supplementation, then you've got things like mega microbalance formula, SF722 or oregano oil just as some examples, of course, there's many different examples that you could use to help lower yeast or, or start to work to lower that down. Um, so it might be one of the first things here I would do would be, we might give either medication or supplementation to start to address this yeast, start to try and improve the, the, the Clostridia family. And then as we get into the microbiology here, we, we've got you know, from the culturomics, we've got increased Klebsiella, um, which, again, if this patient has some kind of inflammatory bowel disease, may be relevant to, to that. Um, and this is nice. When we get the, the, the culturomics here, we also get the end of the report. We, we get the answers as to regards what's going to be most effective to use on that bacteria. 
So as we're getting through the store chemistries, elastase, fat stain, carbides, all looks good. So there's no necessarily indication here for like digestive enzyme use, support, et cetera there. Inflammation, we've got high um, lactoferrin um, and lysozyme is borderline. So again, lactoferrin is a, a marker which may increase um, prior to a flare in IBD, for example. Calprotectin is more the, the gold standard, but certainly with, with this result here, and if the patient's not had a colonoscopy, then I would be referring back to their doctor to have a discussion about is that is that relevant? So we've got high secretory IgA here. So we've got an immune system or you know, that's one of those first lines of defense that's a bit overactive. And then short chain fatty acids, overall okay, but we've certainly got some Im imbalances going on. And then low pH here. So then we, we have the susceptibility report. So if you're going to decide to if you like work with that Klebsiella and treat it, you, you've then got the prescriptive agents at the bottom here, which are best to use, or you've got the, um, the natural agents. So again, you wanna pick something with, with, with high susceptibility because that's gonna be most effective in treating that. So in regards to other, yeah, just what we, we saw in this, uh, we've got the, the Firmicutes phyla. So things that can basically increase that, I've listed here and we'll include the references for this when we send it out. So if you want to increase Firmicutes, these are different strategies that you can use. Um, so we have products like biotogen or inulin that we, we could use. We can go for food approach. If, for example, someone has an overgrowth of Firmicutes, um, then we, we can decrease it through, through these um, strategies as well. Rather confusingly in research, we have things like pistachios, which have been shown to both potentially increase and decrease Firmicutes family. So it's not always so, so clear. But um, these are things, again, we're from seeing dysbiosis, strategies that we'll use to try and address that directly. Then bacterioidity, same, same here. So what can actually increase that? And what can decrease it? Um, often elevated in people with type two diabetes, for example. Uh, so again, just different things that we might include in the diet to, to address like more general dysbiosis. Now pH we saw in this report was, was low. Um, so when there's a low pH that can contribute to a rapid transit time. Uh, it's not very uh, specific. So it could be food intolerance, viral, bacterial and parasite infection. And it's common with lactose malabsorption or intolerance. So if you do see low pH, then definitely if the, the client hasn't or, you, or you've not explored lactose intolerance, then definitely consider that as um, an, a first line intervention. Short chain fatty acids, so key producers here, um, really important for the intestinal cells, um, yeah, mucin production, et cetera. We've got my kind of go-to if butyric acid is low, we can supplement that directly. We also have biotogen, which is a, a combination of um, prebiotics that usually support most of these, these bacteria. So that, that's often one of the supplements that I will we'll use. So lactoferrin, when it's high, I mean, we're, we're going to check for enteropathogens. We could see from this report that, that it wasn't. Might be due to just um, imbalance in the GI microbiome. So it might be that once we address that, that, that dysbiosis, that yeast issue, that that might help to reduce risk of flares in IBD, for example. And we can use inflammation modulation strategies. I mean, there's many different uh, supplements or, or strategies from like prolong, fasting mimicking diet. Of course, we have everything from like curcumin, broccolox, you know, omega-3, for example, that can, um, that can help to potentially reduce or, or modulate inflammation in the, in the GI tract. So then we, we get to the, the GI effects and we go again through a few of the differences here. 
So I think this is where the report is, is doing a really great job because it's dividing it into these five different sections. So we have maldigestion, inflammation, dysbiosis, metabolic imbalance and infection. So you can see already from this first page, okay, what, what's going on. So we have low pancreatic elastase. So it's actually giving you, I just need to move my window here, but it's actually giving you the options. So therapeutic support options down the bottom here for each of these sections. So it really hand holds you along the, along the journey. Um, so of course we know here we've got considerable dysbiosis going on. We've got inflammation, we've got infection. So then the, all of those are going to have to be addressed. Um, so really nice with the, the kind of new release of this GIFX report. This is a fairly recent change, uh, really helping to summarize what's, what's going on and what interventions you can do without having to you know, dig into kind of the textbooks and, and guides, et cetera. So again, you know, Genova have really built on their, um, their visuals here showing again, various diagrams about the commensal balance and where you, if you're doing this on yourself or your client, lands in the different zones and what that's been associated with. Um, here we have an, an example report. So we've got uh, low pancreatic elastase. So it might be, again, here, we're going to need to use something like digestive enzymes to, to help support them in that area. They may need further investigation and analysis for pancreatic insufficiency. Um, but we see a lot of, I would say, subclinical cases in these tests where they, they don't necessarily have any major evidence of um, you know, a, a pancreatic disease process occurring, but they might just improve function with enzyme supplementation. Of course, this can be caused or affected by things like SIBO. So uh, again, it might be once SIBO has been addressed that this improves or other lifestyle factors. Um, so in this case, normally I would use start using some digestive enzymes. We've got a, a high calprotectin here. So this patient, if they've not been investigated for inflammatory bowel disease, they, they should be. Um, or at least referred to a gastroenterologist who can confirm whether or not that needs to happen. We have the high EPX marker. So again, inflammation going on might be food related, um, but not, not too bad in, the, in, the, in the, the short chain fatty acid balance, no issue with beta glucuronidase. And then of course, we have the, the commensal bacteria going on here on the right hand side of the, the slide so in, in regards to like calprotect and epx we might use something like gi revive broccolox again there's there's many different strategies that could be used to to try and help to modulate this um, that you can use so some of the complexity with your this um this report is that you might get a report of course it's it's nice when all many markers are high or many markers are low. Now, generally here, what we're seeing in this report is that many markers are high. There's more a predisposition to bacterial overgrowth. Um, so it's a bit easier to deal with because then we could use some like general broad spectrum herbal treatment to, to try and actually lower those levels. What's nice with the GI effects that you, you don't get in the GI 360 is we get things like oxalobacter here and relationship with, with oxalates. We also get this um, uh, the sulfur vibrio pyger, um, which has got links, of course, with hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so these can give you hidden insights of whether, okay, could oxalates be an issue? Could this be hydrogen sulfide? So in this case, we can see we've got high methanobacter um, uh, sorry, methano brevibacter smithi. We have high uh, decil vibrio pyger. So um, again, this is probably you know, indicating 
uh, likely SIBO, possibly two types of SIBO. Of course, we don't know necessarily know the positioning of this bacteria if we've not run a SIBO test along with it. But this would, again, be really nice to run with a SIBO, a SIBO test. So then we can see possibly we have to treat this, um, this, uh, this patient or client for two different types of SIBO, as well as the more general microbiome. We're going to have to try and lower the inflammation and improve the um, pancreatic function. So again, then we get the, 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 the culturomics part. Um, so again, different types of technology being used. We've got Klebsiella here um, and Candida species, which are uh, potential pathogens. Um, again, we might be using some kind of, um, yeah, uh, Candida treatment, uh, whether that's medication or supplementation, of course, up to you and your, your practice. We then have blastocystis and diantamoeba fragilis detected here. So again, um, this, this patient literally has a, a really nice cocktail of different things going on. So usually with, with these two, I mean, again, blastocystis is debatable whether it should be treated or not. And I think it depends on the clinical picture. I mean, there's so many other things here to work on, but I would work on those things ahead of that. But certainly diantamoeba fragilis has um, connections with, with IBS. So usually for, for, these, for these two, either I'm going to use some kind of broad spectrum or if the patient's more sensitive, then I might use a single intervention like a ADP to see if, if that helps. So it really patient dependent, are they on any of the medication? Do we want to risk interactions, et cetera? Or do we want to go in something more, more simple to, to start with? Then a really cool thing with the GIFX um, is that it actually the only test to do blastocystis um, subtyping. So we can see what type of blastocystis hominis it actually is. And there's some research connecting things like inflammatory bowel disease outcomes with subtypes of blastocystis. So uh, we may certainly do this test with patients that have IBD and we know they've been they've had blastocystis found in previous tests I want to see is that actually possibly connected there um, here's your your PCR technology so in this case we've got both blastocystis and diantamoeba fragilis detected both with PCR and with microscopy so it's a very very solid confirmation that those are are present and then same here, we've got then what are the effective either antifungal medication or the, the natural agents to help you pick which is best. Um, just explains how to read this report if you're not used to actually looking at those reports. So again, the GI effects, you know, the unique aspects are certainly the EPX marker, the blastocystis hominis subtypes. We can get an indication of hydrogen sulfide SIBO possibly. And of course we have the oxalobacter former genus, which can of course, um, or uh, basically help with oxalate metabolism. Um, so if that level is very, very low, it may be worthwhile trying a lower oxalate diet to see if that relieves um, IBS type symptoms. So um, I think when you, you know, to bring a kind of summary to this, really you, um, you want to, to look at, of course, the patient history and symptoms and clinical picture, see what you think um, may be involved with those symptoms. If you're new to testing, it might be better to start with something like a CSAP because that's easier than a GI map because you get a lot more commentary and handholding through the report. Um, then use like your GI 360 or your GI FX if you want that broader microbiome analysis and you're more comfortable with working with get a, a more complex report where there might be conflicting evidence or information. You know, it's very difficult when you get a lot of 
a lot of bacterial strains that are low and a lot of high, the kind of, you know, this is a common question. What, what do we do with that? Um, and it's not necessarily a simple answer. Then, um, yeah, try and look with their symptoms and their history. Do you want something like blastocystis subtype? Do you want to look at, um, you know, potentially oxalate, um, uh, like, uh, yeah, susceptibility? Do you want to look for the largest amount of pathogens possible um, or more unusual species? So um, I think that that's really the basis for your clinical decision making on which which test to run uh, is, is looking at the, the, the clinical picture and then trying to, to, to use the test that, that best fits that. But of course, they're all very similar. You're not going to go largely wrong unless, like I said, you you're, you're trying to look for some kind of yeast that yeah, the, the GI map just doesn't evaluate for. Um, and then as per usual, work through the report you know, and make any referrals to necessary medical practitioners if you're not one yourself. Um, you know, think back to lifestyle factors, causative factors, you know, really try and put your, your detective hat on to work back. Was this from food poisoning? Is this driven through stress? Has there been some kind of injury or surgery? Um, work with the easiest things in the report first. Of course, if you simply get your, your patient fitter, then their diversity will, um, will naturally get, get better, for example. So not, not everything is just food or supplement related. Remember, you, you, you're, it's going to be very difficult to out supplement a poor lifestyle. So think about all the related factors like everything from you know, the sun and vitamin D to circadian rhythm to like medication use. All of these things will affect the microbiome. And remember, it is complex and we don't have all the answers. Um, and um, just try and gradually work the, the client through you know, or patient through step, step by step. Um, it's not always going to just help to just give supplementation and expect things to, to be okay. You're, again, like most of us, I'm sure on the call here, we, we will you know, be looking heavily into lifestyle. So that's kind of a, a brief summary on those, those two tests. Super. And of course, there was lots of activity going on in the chat box during Mm. Uh, and I, I think I lost track at some stage, <laughs> um, but I did manage to put down a few uh, areas that we that might be interesting to just talk a little bit freely about. But one uh, one came up in regards to stability on some of these tests, and um, we we we. It's not a problem if you live in a big city, let's say you live in London or you live close to where DHL can, can pick up then uh, because the, the, the GI fix says they have seven day stability. Um, but if you live, uh, let's say in Finland and or Sweden and or Norway and where you live is far away from a DHL hub, then it may take an extra day to ship even though they kind of guarantee a, a 48 hour or 24 hour delivery in Europe, but uh, they don't if, if you live out in the mountains and somewhere in Norway or something, then it does take another day. So, um, but, but if, so if you really wanna do the uh, GI fix, then you just have to take that into consideration uh, that the patient really has to collect and ship uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so that we can get it to the lab um, within the seven days because they're really harsh on just uh, cancelling the test. Uh, where uh, GI360 has uh, at least 10 days uh, stability time, um, so that allows for a little bit uh, longer. And the GI map is, is quite stable as well uh, because it's, um, it's kept stable as long as it's in a freezer. So, and um, we of course ship everything on Medical Express and we ship it with dry ice um, 
uh, and, and, and frozen. Uh, so so we, we, we kind of like stop the, uh, or carry, so not stop, but carry on the, the freezer um, period and, and stability period for the, with, the, with the GI map as soon as we get it to, uh, to Copenhagen and it's stable there, then it's basically stable the rest of the way. So I just want to put a little bit of attention to that as well. Um, but then, um, mm, 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 mm. then we had another thing that came up in regards to stomach acid um, and symptoms for low stomach acid and what markers can indicate the low uh, stomach acid. And of course, Graham touched some of it, it uh, at least the, the last day's uh, marker. Um, how that can not directly indicate, but possibly indirectly indicate uh, something. But actually, I think, because um, Graham has just been doing these uh, mentorship um, programs in regards to digestion and some of the stool tests and so on. And it's, it's if, if you feel a little bit insecure on some of the symptoms in regards to what tests and how to interpret and so on. I can only encourage you to sign up for, for, for some of these when, when we offer them. Um, but, but the elastase for sure is a marker I look at and I always think, um, how does the stomach act? What about you, Graham? What have you got to say to that? Yeah, um, the, yeah elastase is, is definitely a, a key one that, that can indicate that. Um, in the bacillus species, uh, so high levels of bacillus species, maybe from reduced digestive function in general. Uh, also, like Staphylococcus, maybe again from from low low level stomach acid, um, Streptococcus as well. So some, I mean, again, it, of course, it's it's very it's very difficult to say that's just because of low stomach acid it, of course could be a number of different reasons but usually i'm looking at the commensal flora and seeing what's what's present and by how much in combination with things like was there helicobacter pylori and how much what are the patient symptoms what's the elastase level um and trying to triangulate that a little into are we going to directly then support with with betaine hcl or are we going to just use lemon water and apple cider vinegar or swedish bitters something like that um and then of course we might try that and see do the do the symptoms improve or or is it no different what's stool consistency like etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, so unless you're doing some kind of smart pill analysis I think it's with HCL, I think it's stomach acid, it's still very much a bit of trial and error. Um, and of course it depends on things like the um, the, muc the, the stomach mucosa, which then we pick up from an IPA analysis, because then maybe if the stomach mucosa is very damaged, um, then of course it may not be best to, to be using HCL at that point we want to try and solve that mucosa issue and then maybe give a bit of HCL and see if that restarts things, so to speak. Um, that I think like most things, it's, it's, it's common. Ideally we'd have a smart pill test and we could just see the pH is, is too high. And then we, we know, uh, but of course, um, yeah, smart pill tests are not done very often, usually in you know, research hospitals. So um, another thing came up just uh, at the end here, and that's um, stopping probiotics prior to taking a test, uh, stopping like how long time after antibiotics. Some labs says two weeks, some labs says 10 days. Uh, uh, so you have to stop probiotics before uh, collecting. I have my own view on this. Um, and it's, if I have a patient who comes to me and uh, they, uh, they have come to get help quickly. And um, if they have to wait two weeks because they have to stop taking probiotics <clears throat> two weeks or 10 days, it can be 
um, it's quite a lot of time waiting because then after the after they've done the test then they have to wait another three weeks maybe to get the results so that's waiting five weeks for a result so I'm I'm actually a little bit loose on that side and I just kind of say just just collect and uh, we'll go through the results um, but what do you say on that Graham? Yeah, I mean, well, you GI map the most, which has the least restrictions on on actual like supplements or medication use, because of course it just uses PCR. So, um, yeah, I think it, how long? I mean, if they if they've been on that probiotic for a long, long time, um, then probably going to yeah, not change anything that they're doing. So I just want to see, well, how is everything functioning based on. Yeah, I don't want to change their clinical picture for a test because then I'm potentially clouding the results. So, um, yeah, I'm a, a bit more like like you. I, I think you've got to, got to take it into consideration and how fast you want results. And do you want to see what's going on with probiotic or with HCL or without? You know, and then can you can you afford the time or, or not? Um, but because mostly we use GI Mac, which basically you can you can use when on antibiotics or anything you 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 want to. But you're of course like any if you're ever doing a test, you're getting a reflection of that moment in time based on all of those factors. And that goes for um, proton pump inhibitors. Ping now I can't pronounce it. Inhibitors. Inhibitors. Yeah. <laughs> As well, if if the patient can't live without it, uh, that's then just collect on it. Um, you you don't necessarily want a person to stop because they have to do that, and that may in itself create all sorts of symptoms. Having to stop on the PPI just to do a test. Of course, the aim is to get them off it. But again, you have to kind of evaluate if 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 it's worth the wait, if it's worth the, the, the challenge and so on for, uh, for doing the test. Another thing, because a lot of questions have come up here, well, why was it positive in the urine, the yeast, but negative in the stool test and why was it? And I think I'm just going to say kind of um, a little bit like there is no perfect stool test. There is no um, perfect lab test in general uh, there's always weaknesses um to the different lab tests and uh, yeah if, if, if it's of course taking the same day you can question a little bit more uh, what's going on here if there's a couple of weeks in between collection of a urine test and a stool test well what has happened in between and so on and we did and, and Graham was the guinea pig uh, some time ago. We did, um, we, 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 we asked three people to uh, collect stool tests from eight different labs or something. And uh, that was, and, and we did triple splits with the different labs. So we are talking about many days and many uh, tubes that needs to be filled up with, with, with stool tests in the, and, the, and the, the aim was really to find out if there is a perfect stool test. And what Graham is elegantly also showing here is that there is different, you choose one lab test for, for one thing or another patient, and you kind of have to go with the feel as to what test is the right one for this patient with these symptoms and this history. And then you always have to interpret the result with like it's it, carefully and uh, it's it's not always white and black and um, black and white <laughs> so uh but but it's an amazing tool because it gives us information that we can't guess and uh, it, it gives us support to be better practitioners but we have to like be gentle when interpreting the results no matter what so um i think that's it for now anyone who has a last thing that pops up suddenly otherwise i think we will say thank you to you graham and um then uh thyroid is uh, next time and um between well before graham um talks on thyroid, we have the, on the 3rd of June, um, a lecture on probiotics, which is of course interesting, 
also to follow up with in regards to just having covered uh, a lot of stool tests and digestive issues. So thank you very much, Graham. Thank you everybody out there around the globe uh, for joining and thank you for your questions. Take care and Great. see you soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye.